So that's what we are going to be talking about in this class, the dangers that are created by some kinds of oxygen regulators. Henry, you have a question. Well, I've been a firefighter for 11 years now, and I work with oxygen regulators every day on the job. And what you've just showed us, well, I've never seen anything like that happen. Well, even though you may have never seen it happen, the potential is there. The point I'm trying to make is that it very well could. Think about when you perform your equipment checkout at the beginning of a shift. Day in and day out, like firefighters all over the country, you go through standard procedures to make sure that the regulator on your oxygen cylinder is functioning properly. Now, even though you may be doing everything exactly the way you've been trained to do, an explosion could still occur. All it takes is just one time for something to go wrong. In recent years, there have been a number of reported incidents involving aluminum oxygen regulators. They've either burned or exploded. Many of these accidents happen during emergency medical use or a routine equipment checkout. Now, although there may have been other contributing factors, FDA and NIOSH believe that aluminum in the regulators played a large role in both the ignition and the severity of the fires. Now, the point of our training session is that although these accidents are rare, they could very well happen to anybody, even you. I talked with uh, several people in the field who have been victims of oxygen regulator explosions, and one of them told me that he was doing everything exactly the way he was supposed to do. We just did a daily check, checked the pressure, make sure we had enough to run any kind of medicals for that day, and check any equipment. And when I went to turn on the regulator, turn on the bottle for the oxygen to check the pressure, I, well, I heard a sound. I didn't see it initially because what a habit I've gotten into turning on the bottles is that I turn my head away from the bottle. Heard, can't quite describe it, but it was more of a, a, a high pressure leak and then also the sound of, of something burning, something burnt, violent, violent, uh, not quite explosion, but just a high pressure leak with violent uh, burning or, or, or fire sound. I did what I was trained to do and I performed that function uh, for the last 11 years and I haven't changed anything in, in the way I've been opening the bottle or, or actually um, working with the bottle. Um, it was at shift change. I worked night shifts. I had just gotten into work at 7 p.m. at a location we call Medic 6. I had gone outside to start checking off the truck like we normally do. Right when I cut it on, I heard the normal spew of air into the regulator and then it sounded like a gun went off. And um, there was a flash and I just remember seeing flames and feeling the severe pain from the fire and running inside to get help. From those comments, you can see that this is a very serious situation. And when you think that oxygen regulators are used in a wide variety of different environments, the problem is compounded even more so. So now you see why the safety of oxygen regulators is very important for keeping yourself and others out of jeopardy. Yes, Stan. How many oxygen regulators are out there being used? I mean, does anybody know? Current estimates are that there are about 20 million high pressure regulators that are now in distribution and about one and a half million of them are used for medical reasons. Well, I know that I have one in the trunk of my squad car, and I realize they're carried on emergency response vehicles, but what other kinds of uses are there for them? In addition to their use with fire departments and rescue squads, oxygen regulators are also found in hospitals, aboard ships, in nursing homes, on airlines, in home health care, on oil rigs, and even for dealing with scuba diving accidents. So as you can see, oxygen regulators are used in a wide variety of instances. Yes? I'm a nurse, and I was taught very early on not to let anyone smoke around a patient who's on oxygen. What is it about high-pressure oxygen that makes it so dangerous? Um, how can it cause fires? Oxygen itself doesn't burn, but it does support combustion. Now, there's something that's called the fire triangle that you need to understand in order to handle oxygen equipment safely. The fire triangle is comprised of three things that are needed to start a fire. Oxygen, 
fuel, and a heat source. So in order to start a fire, you need all three of these items and not just oxygen. Actually, 100% oxygen, like the kind that's used for emergency medical first aid, accelerates the burning process, but it doesn't burn. Let me show you a tape that demonstrates the difference between burning something in air as opposed to burning something in pure oxygen. Now here you see an example of the same material that's been set on fire in regular air and the same material saturated with pure oxygen. Now you notice that in the regular air it's burning slowly, but the part that's saturated with pure oxygen flames up very quickly. Now the paramedic that I showed you on the tape at the beginning of the class was doing everything right. There wasn't any visible ignition and yet an explosion still occurred. And I also mentioned that this could happen during a routine equipment checkout. It comes down to the different characteristics between aluminum and brass regulators. Now aluminum and its alloys are much more flammable and more likely to ignite than brass. One doesn't normally think of metals as being something that burn. They don't in normal air, but they do when it comes to pure oxygen. In standard tests, aluminum burns at pressures as low as 25 pounds per square inch in pure oxygen. Brass, on the other hand, resists burning at pressures as high as 10,000 psi in pure oxygen. Now what you're seeing here is a test showing how regulators made of aluminum and brass behave at pressures that are found in oxygen equipment. You'll notice that the aluminum regulator can burn violently if it ignites, while the one made of brass is more likely to contain the fire. I understand the difference between aluminum and brass and how brass resists ignition and burning. But I've been an EMT for a few years now, and I've only used aluminum regulators. I didn't know they were also made out of brass. Isn't aluminum pretty much the standard? Well, that's because aluminum is mostly used for medical reasons because it's lighter than brass. When you take an aluminum regulator and combine that with a cylinder that's made out of aluminum, the overall weight of the equipment is less. Now, let's go back to that fire triangle that I mentioned a short while ago. Now, what do you think are some factors that could contribute to ignition? Well, it could be something like lighting up a cigarette, but all of us who work with such equipment um, have been trained not to do something dumb like that. Right, that's one possibility for ignition. There are also several other possibilities. One contributing factor is particle impact. Now, this one involves small particles that are generated during assembly. Now, over time, these particles can flake off from inside the cylinder. Now what happens is that these small particles can be caught up in the flowing oxygen and accelerated to a high velocity. When the particles hit the internal surfaces of the valve or the regulator, heat is generated. Now although these small particles wouldn't burn in air under high pressure, they can burn in oxygen, and that can ignite a fire. You mean that's all it takes, just opening the post valve and they can blow up in your face? Unfortunately, yes. In one of the interviews, Charlotte James said that she wasn't doing anything wrong. I couldn't understand. I didn't do anything wrong. It was a normal day. Nothing peculiar going on. I cut it on like I have done for two or three years, checking the oxygen off, and I just couldn't understand why this was happening to me. Uh, my first reaction was, uh, did I do the procedure correctly? And in my mind, after doing it 11 years, I realized that I was doing it right. And uh, at that point, I just couldn't figure out what really went wrong. So let's talk about some other things that can contribute to ignition. Now, we've already covered one contributing factor, particle impact. Now, another contributing factor is adiabatic compression, also called the heat of compression. Now, this happens when you open the post valve and pressurize the regulator. Oxygen rushes into the high pressure side of the regulator, now, as the gas rapidly compresses in this closed compartment, heat is generated, which can also ignite any non-metallic part of the regulator. That heat can also ignite contaminants inside the regulator, which brings me to my next point, contamination. Now, this involves 
exposing parts of a regulator or a cylinder to a contaminant like grease or an oil-based lubricant, parts that come into contact with the high-pressure oxygen. Now, those contaminants are very easy to ignite, either by particle impact or adiabatic compression. Let's say you are changing out a regulator and you need a wrench. You don't have one handy, so you go to another work bay and borrow one that may have been used to change a tire or fix a spark plug in an engine. Now, that sort of thing never happens at your place, right? <laughs> Well, if it does, there's a serious risk of fire the next time that regulator is used because that wrench you used may have been contaminated with oil, grease, or some other lubricant. And if that contaminant finds its way into the cylinder, then safety can be seriously compromised. Yes? You know, I've been an EMT for a very long time now, and I've used aluminum oxygen regulators pretty much since my very first day on the job. I've never had a problem with them and I've never heard of anybody else having a problem, at least until now. Why all of a sudden do we need to worry about this? Well, there have been a number of reported incidents involving flash fires or explosions with aluminum oxygen regulators. Now, these accidents have been documented by government agencies like FDA, uh, NIOSH, and NASA. As a matter of fact, one person has died. Others' victims have suffered second and third degree burns. This isn't to mention the emotional trauma that they've all gone through. Extensive and painful skin grafts and long absences from work. In fact, one victim that I spoke with said that she had suffered deep second degree burns on both palms of her hands. Both forearms, my abdomen, and both thighs to my knees. First degree burns to my face and neck. This hand had direct flame contact. Luckily, I had my uniform jacket on, so right here the burns, there's a, there's a, th a line there where the burns stop. So the nylon just being the bag that just basically started popping up, landing on my hand all over my jacket and pants. The, in the incident occurred January 20th, 1999. I've been off the job ever since then. I'm still in rehab and I'm still uh, recovering from my injuries. Being the summer months and having scars on my legs, I was kind of self-conscious of that. Um, as far as work goes, I've yet to return back to the truck. I am scared to death to be around oxygen. So just being around it, I feel really uncomfortable. Uh, it's, like I said, it, it's, it's a memory that's still, it's still there. It's been over a year and it's still like it was yesterday. You can see that although an oxygen regulator fire is rare, it can end a career, or even a life. Okay, I think we all understand there's a problem, but what can we do to correct it? Well, you can do that by utilizing the proper methods for storage, maintenance, and handling. Now, first of all, you need to store oxygen in a clean, dry location, away from direct sunlight. This is because materials burn much more rapidly when permeated with enriched oxygen rather than normal air. Now, I think somebody already mentioned this next item. Don't allow smoking near oxygen equipment, or any type of flame, for that matter. Don't allow post valves, regulators, gauges, or fittings to come in contact with oils, grease, organic lubricants, or any other kind of combustible substance. And as I said a minute ago, make sure that any cleaning, repairing, or transfilling of oxygen equipment is performed by qualified personnel. Usually this involves turning the oxygen unit over to the manufacturer or a qualified third party. If these tasks are to be performed by someone on staff, then that person needs to be properly trained and certified. Uh, for example, pressure gauge change out uh, and contamination have proven to be a problem when handled by someone who isn't properly trained or certified. If work is performed on oxygen regulators within your department, it's essential to designate special tools that are labeled for use with oxygen equipment only. These tools also need to be kept clean and stored separately. It's also important not to block the regulator's vent holes with any added components, such as gauge guards. And finally, use plugs, caps, or plastic bags to protect off-duty oxygen equipment from dust and dirt. 
A fire chief that I talked with made an important comment about the safety problems that occur with aluminum oxygen regulators and how his department made the transition to brass. So we made a decision to replace our regulators that same day. And our instructions were to the uh, guy in charge of it to get new regulators here any way possible that day. And so we replaced all our regulators with brass bodied regulators the same day of the accident. It's, it's been shown over and over again that, that aluminum regulators have a propensity to, to catch fire or to propagate fire. And uh, brass regulators would give us the peace of mind and safety that we need to provide our service. And that was what they found was that brass was a little bit better material because it didn't ignite when introduced to oxygen at high pressures. So that's why we started looking at, at the brass regulators and we moved in that direction quite quickly. Another thing that you need to consider besides brass versus aluminum are the materials that are used in different components of the system. For instance, you should select a brass regulator that uses a sintered bronze filter rather than one that uses a less fire resistant metal such as stainless steel. Another important consideration is the gasket. It also should be as fire resistant as possible. It's also essential that non-flammable lubricants and cleaning agents be used in maintaining oxygen equipment and that they be used as sparingly as possible. So yes. now, wait a minute. Didn't you say that servicing should be done by a qualified technician? My department's SOP is to send them out. That's exactly what should be done. Whenever a regulator needs to be serviced, it should be done by the manufacturer or a qualified third party. In fact, once you accept the proper regulator, it needs to be properly maintained according to the manufacturer's specifications. Okay, um, let's assume that I follow the manufacturer's recommendations for a regulator that's in the trunk of my squad car. Uh, let's also say that it's an aluminum regulator. To tell the truth, I don't know if it is or if it isn't, but uh, let's just say it is. I'll bet there's nothing in the operator's manual about a possible fire or explosion. How are we supposed to use aluminum regulators so that this doesn't happen? In minimizing the likelihood of igniting a fire or to lessen the severity of injuries in case one should occur, it's extremely important to properly check out, set up, and use your oxygen regulator. For instance, you mentioned that the regulator is stored in your vehicle's trunk. Is the trunk clean? Or is the oxygen unit lying under some dirty rags? Now we'll go over some of the steps that you'll need to follow in order to safely use and handle a cylinder and regulator. Now the first thing that you'll want to do is you want to wash your hands. Make sure that they're clean and free of any oil, dirt, or debris. Next, you want to visually inspect the cylinder and the post valve for any signs of dust, dirt, or debris. Don't use the cylinder if it's dirty or rusty or overdue for routine maintenance or inspection. You'll also want to check the color of the cylinder and the drug label to verify that the cylinder content is oxygen. Holding the cylinder at arm's length with the fingers of one hand around the neck of the cylinder and your thumb pressed against the plastic cover over the valve stem port opening, pull down on the plastic tab here with your other hand. Now this tab is placed on the valve stem after the cylinder is refilled with oxygen in order to keep the valve stem port opening clean. Now be careful here because this plastic cover may contain an extra O-ring in case the O-ring supplied initially by the regulator manufacturer is worn out, distorted, or missing. So take the plastic cover with the O-ring, place it on a clean cloth until the pre-use check is completed. So again, with the cylinder at arm's length, the port opening pointed away from you and anyone else in the area, take the cylinder key, place it on the valve stem, Slowly open the valve for a couple of seconds and then close again. This is done to blow out any debris that may have accumulated around the port opening. Remember when we talked about possible sources of ignition earlier? Well, opening the valve slowly here is very important in order to minimize the heat of compression, which also reduces the chance of a fire. If any problems are experienced in opening the valve, don't use the cylinder. Never force any valve to open. So again, let's recap. Visually inspect the cylinder at arm's length. Keep the port opening pointed away from you and from anyone else in the area. 
Open the valve slowly for a couple of seconds and then close again. Okay, now we are ready to visually inspect the oxygen regulator. Again, make sure that it's clean and free from any dirt, dust, or debris. Now, you see these two pins here? They are designed to fit into two identically sized holes on the cylinder valve stem. Now, make sure that the pins are straight and free of dirt. And also make sure that this gasket, which is supplied by the regulator manufacturer, is in place around the opening of the regulator just above the pins. Now, this gasket is designed to ensure a tight fit between the regulator and the cylinder valve. So using the one recommended by the manufacturer is best. If the gasket is distorted, compressed, out of shape, or dirty, then replace it with one recommended by the regulator manufacturer, like the one I showed you earlier in the protective cap, so that you can ensure the best possible fit. Most of all, make sure that only one gasket is used. Slide the regulator yoke over the valve stem, line up the port opening and the regulator pins, and tighten using the wing nut. Now you want to get a good hand tight seal here because you don't want any wobble or looseness that can cause a leak when you turn the cylinder on. And make sure that the flow control valve is turned to the off position. Okay, now let's check out the oxygen flow. You want to take the cylinder key, place it on the cylinder valve stem, Again, making sure that you have the gauge and the port opening pointed away from you and anyone else in the area. Then you want to very slowly open the cylinder fully and then back half a turn. Next, you want to place your hand underneath the barbed connector outflow, open the flow control valve, to verify the oxygen flow, and then close the flow control valve. Once you've closed the flow control valve, you can close the valve on the cylinder slowly and tightly, and then reopen the flow control valve in order to bleed out any remaining oxygen in the regulator until the pressure goes back down to zero. Then you want to place the cylinder back in a cylinder caddy or a holding bay on your rescue unit. It's preferable that you store cylinders in an upright location, but that will be dictated by how much space you have in your rescue unit. What is important is that you have the cylinders secured and in a clean location. So again, take care how you store the unit in your rescue vehicle. Okay, let's recap. Clean hands, visual inspection, slowly open valves, and store in a clean place in an upright location. Now you can see it doesn't take a lot of time to do this kind of thing safely and correctly. When I talked to Jerry Hammernick, he told me that the best advice he could give is to take action immediately. Um, follow the guidelines that we've learned through the studies, through these incidents that have happened. Make the changes in your department. Spend the money if necessary, but fix it, because the cost down the line in both dollars and in human cost is much higher than anything you will spend to fix the problem today. It's, it'll be quite obvious once you look into this and educate yourself on how this stuff is used, uh, the safer regulators that are out there. And, you, and I feel quite confident that you'll make the change to the safer regulators. The main thing that we would really like the other folks to do is take a look at their equipment, not be complacent, because it's easy to do. Um, try and stay on top of the information curve. That's one of the, probably the most important things to do. If that accident's occurred in your department, that percentage is pretty high. So it's pretty easy to justify going to the brass regulator for us. We have learned a lot. We've learned a lot from the experts we've brought in and from the experience that we've had. And from all those, I came to a conclusion that in order to give peace of mind and safety to my people, as well as the public we serve, we made the change to full brass-bodied regulators. Hopefully, by now, you have an appreciation of the potential fire hazards presented by oxygen regulators and an understanding about what you can do to maintain your safety and the safety of those around you. Now, although these kinds of instances are fairly rare, the consequences can be severe and long-lasting. None of the people you saw on the tape ever thought anything like this could happen to them. 
but it did. Although their physical scars may have healed, they still have emotional ones to deal with. And that's not to mention that they are now unable to continue in the careers they love. That's it for this morning's session. What I'd like for you to do when you get back to your jobs is to share the information you've learned here today with your coworkers. Try and watch how they handle oxygen regulators and cylinders. Let them know how to safely check out their equipment and minimize the chance of an accident. If you'd like more information on oxygen regulators, feel free to give me a call. Or you can go online and check out the web page of the Food and Drug Administration. It provides a public health advisory issued by FDA and NIOSH. Based on field reports, this advisory explains the hazards presented by aluminum oxygen regulators. It also offers many of the safety procedures that we've covered today. NIOSH also has a web page that offers details about an oxygen regulator incident in Florida. Some other helpful websites include the Compressed Gas Association, the National Fire Protection Association, and the American Society for Testing and Materials. Remember, by using the proper safety procedures and using the right equipment in the right way, you can reduce the possibility of igniting a fire. Now let's be safe out there. Thanks. Hey Kim, hold on. I just took a course a couple of weeks ago and I picked up some safety tips that might help prevent a possible explosion. Great.